of the mystery which was from eternity. The Son of God becomes the Son of the Virgin. So, truly today is the beginning of our salvation, for it is the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The incarnation we understand in the Orthodox Church to be the totality of our salvation. In other words, our salvation is not simply one single action, one single event, for example, the crucifixion as is commonly proposed in, <clears throat> in other confessions, but rather our salvation is the totality of the incarnation of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ. And that incarnation begins today with the conception of the incarnate word in the womb of the Most Holy Virgin. And we know that, that the, the conception of a human being is the beginning of life. It is the union of soul and body. And this is affirmed most vehemently, most vigorously by the fathers of the church. St. Maximus the Confessor, for example, in his 47th Ambigua, has a long explanation of the fact that the soul does not join with the body at the 40th day after conception, but rather at the very moment of conception. And he explicitly applies this, or uses this, referring to our Lord Jesus Christ, that it was at the very moment of the conception that his divinity was united to his humanity and that he became man. It does not, it does not matter that he was merely a, an embryo in the, in the womb. The mystery of the incarnation had already been accomplished. The mystery of our salvation was already in action. This was the mystery which was hidden from eternity and was manifest today, namely the deification of man the union of man with God, which is found in its perfected form in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the first fruits of our salvation and whom we follow as faithful believers and members of the church. Now, who was it? who became the vehicle for the incarnation, the vehicle for our salvation. It was the most holy lady Theotokos, an ever-Virgin Mary, the most perfect person who had ever existed on the earth and indeed whoever can exist. The summation of all the virtues, the pinnacle of perfection, that person whom the entire human race had been prepared produce by means of successively more perfect generations. Who is this most holy lady Theotokos? She is, according to the interpretation of the fathers of the Old Testament, the bush that was unburnt by the fire of the Godhead. She is the vessel which contained the manna, and that manna, of course, is the bread of life which we Christians partake of in the Holy Eucharist. She is the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the presence of God in 
indeed she is the temple of the living God. Her womb became more spacious than the heavens, and this grace was bestowed upon her because she is more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim. It was because she was without spot, she was without stain, that she was not state worthy of such a great grace. After Amusulilitotos had left the temple where it, wherein she had dwelt from her youth, after she had been bestowed, uh, she had been betrothed <coughs> to the holy elder Joseph, she went to live in Nazareth. And according to the interpretation, the tradition of the fathers, she was sitting at her home in Nazareth, and she was reading the book of Isaiah and contemplating the words, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And at that moment as she was contemplating, what could this possibly mean? A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Behold, the archangel Gabriel appeared unto her and announced unto her the tidings of gladness, the tidings of salvation. Rejoice, he said, thou who art full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Thou hast found favor with the Most High. Now, the archangel Gabriel was no stranger to our most holy lady Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary, for he had ministered unto her when she was living in his temple. And yet, this time, the advent of the holy archangel Gabriel was different. He came with greater glory, for he came with a greater message. He came to announce the incarnation of the Lord. Now, our most holy lady Theotokos, despite already being a vessel of grace, nevertheless was perplexed. And she said, how can this be? Because I know not a man. And the archangel replied that the Holy Spirit shall overshadow thee. The power of the Most High shall dwell within you. And what was the response of the Most Holy Lady Theotokos? She said, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord be unto me according to thy will. This was in order to show that every human being possesses free will. Every human being can accept God or can reject God. Every human being can choose between good and evil, can choose between the way of righteousness, the way of light, and the way of darkness. Our most holy lady Theotokos, being the most perfect <coughs> servant of the most high, that is of God, accepted the divine will concerning her, accepted that she was to become the vehicle of the salvation of the race of man. And so she said, be it unto me according to thy word. Our, uh, our father among the saints, Maximus the Confessor, refers to this as voluntary surrender. What does that mean? It means that we align our human will together with the will of God that we voluntarily subject ourselves to the divine will. And we do not understand this in a, in a slavish or merely servile fashion, but rather we understand it as being the actualization of the province of God within our own life. What would have been better for our most holy lady Theotokos to accept the word of the archangel and the providence of God concerning her or to reject it? <clears throat> the answer needs no explanation, but we must think about ourselves as well. What is our own reaction to the providence of God in our life? When our Lord proposes to, our, to us or presents us with a situation where we can choose between following the path of God or following our own will, which naturally is corrupted, which is 
subject to sin and the passion, and which inclines toward evil, what is our reaction? Do we accept the providence of God toward us, or do we reject it? Do we say the words of our most holy day, Theotokos, Behold the handmaid of the Lord? In other words, that I am your servant, that I will follow your commandments, that I will follow your injunctions. Do we say, be it unto me according to thy word, or do we resist the word of God? Do we kick against the pricks, as it says in the Acts of the Apostles? This is the decision which confronts every one of us. And perhaps we are a little confused time to time about what the will of God concerning us truly is. The fathers tell us how we resolve this. We fulfill to the best of our ability those small steps which lie in front of us which we know we ought to do. Perhaps it's feeling, fulfilling our obediences more conscientiously. Perhaps it's praying a little bit more fervently or a little longer, or not putting off some task which we ought to do. Perhaps it's getting along with a person who we have a difference of opinion with, or perhaps we perceive has slighted us in some manner. There are very obvious steps which we can do, which we know are God's will for us, because they are in general God's will towards the race of man. And when we fulfill these smaller steps with a good conscience, with the intention of pleasing God, then God will reveal the further steps, the greater steps. And we will be presented with the providence of God for us in our life. And then we will know that we have the choice. Do we accept that providence, as did our most holy lady Theotokos? or do we reject it? It does not matter that this providence is presented to us in a direct form, as with our most holy day, It does not matter if an archangel appears to us and says, behold, this is the plan of God for you. It does not, not, it does not need to be like that. It can be in more subtle forms, but if we are spiritually disposed, we will recognize the providence of God for us. But then, if we have trained ourselves in virtue, if we have trained ourselves to accept God in the small things, those everyday elements of life, then our soul will be prepared to accept the greater things. Indeed, was this not the case with our most holy lady Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary? She had trained herself in virtue from youth. Firstly, of course, she was the offspring of most virtuous parents, of Joachim and Anna, who were the most virtuous people in all of Israel. And this, of course, is an important lesson for those of you who are parents or who are intending to become parents. How important it is for you to rear your children in piety and the love of God and in the pursuit of virtue. And then she continuously struggled while she was in the temple, applying herself to every virtue, to every good deed, to every good thought, to every good contemplation, to continual <coughs> prayer. She trained herself, herself in virtue to such an extent that it became second nature to her. So that when the proof of her virtue came, when the moment of decisiveness came, she did not hesitate, but rather she accepted the word of God for her salvation. This was not going to be easy. It was going to be a difficult time, and indeed it was prophesied unto her that a sword shall pierce thy heart. In other words, it is impossible to, pers to pursue the life of virtue without undergoing suffering. This is the crucifixion, the, cru the participation which every one of us must undertake in the cross of Christ. As St. Paul says, to crucify our members upon the earth, to crucify the passions and lusts. 
And so we celebrate today not only the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, not only the fact that our salvation begins today, but rather, but in addition to that, the most perfect virtue, the most perfect attitude which our Most Holy Lady Theoprocos had towards the providence and the word of God, that attitude, that attentiveness to goodness, virtue, and perfection, we too must also strive to possess. Our Most Holy Lady Theotokos is in everything our model, our exemplar, our leader up to the throne of God. And if we strive to advance in virtue, if we strive to have her always before us, both as model and as intercessor before us, indeed as possessing grace which has been granted to her by God to help us within our spiritual life. If we follow what she did for us in <coughs> accepting God's word and God's providence, then we too will ascend to the heights of virtue. We too will stand before the throne of God we too will be participators in that glory which is without end. Indeed, that is the same kingdom which the Archangel Gabriel proclaimed as were concerning her son, that his kingdom shall be without end. How can, how can one's kingdom be without end? It is only if one is God himself. And so, in an indirect manner at that moment, he, he proclaimed to her that the Messiah which was to be born of her was not merely a prophet, but rather the incarnation of the divine Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, <clears throat> you who are nuns and sisters in this holy convent, you who are lay folk who have come to worship with piety and devotion and to pray to our most holy Lady Zerotopos, let all of us lift up our minds and lift up our hearts to the most holy lady. Let us perceive her greatness. Let us glorify her superb humility and the economy of salvation which she worked for every one of us. Let us beseech her intercessions. Let us beseech her grace so that every one of us, together with the Archangel Gabriel, may cry to her, Rejoice, thou who art full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And through her, to us. That is the calling of every Christian. That is the devotion which every Orthodox Christian ought to have for most holy lady Theotokos, because by glorifying our most holy lady Theotokos, we glorify God. Unto our one God in Trinity, our God who today has become incarnate, the most holy virgin, and unto his most holy and immaculate mother, be glory, honor, praise,